Welcome to Flip Your Lid with Kim Honeycutt. Kim is a psychotherapist and executive director of ICU Talks, a mental health speaking ministry. This is a podcast about how to flip your lid and learning how to reconnect to who you really are. All right. Thank you for being a part of Flip Your Lid. I've got, this is truly my sister. She is truly my peeps. Dr. Lucretia Berry is with me. We've been friends for a really long time and have walked side by side with each other. So I'm going to tell you professionally who she is, but first know that she's my sister. This is Dr. Lucretia Carter Berry. She's the founder and president of Brownicity, an agency committed to making important, scholarly informed anti-racism education accessible. A former college professor, Lucretia designed the popular beginner's course and authored its study guide, What Lies Between Us, Fostering First Steps Toward Racial Healing. She's director of Brown Disney's Learning Community, an online membership platform which currently hosts over 10,000 enrollments. Lucretia is the anti-racism curriculum specialist for Community School of Davidson, that's right here in North Carolina, a contributor for Encourage, I-N, Encourage, Dot me in a TEDx with me, did it together, TEDx speaker. She's also a Q idea speaker. She's married to Nathan. He's a really good guy, and they have three daughters. She earned her PhD in curriculum and instruction and has a master's of art in English from Iowa State University. That's funny. And she has a BA from South Carolina State University. Lucretia, my sister, ugh. I so need you today. I love you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Kim, I love you too. And oh, I love you more, actually. But thank you for having me. Thank you yeah. for this um, this conduit uh, yeah. of, um, of the right sound. It's so mm. important mm. that we um, are resonating the right sound mm. and hearing the right sound so we can speak the right sound. And so thank you for... You wow. know, ha- thank you for creating this and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, to yeah, be- I think we can end it on that. That was so well said. Let's just wrap this okay. up. Like, it's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's about the right yeah. sound. And, you know, uh, you know, when I asked you to do this, this is planned to be produced mm-hmm. in June. And we were just going to talk more mm-hmm. about personally what's going on with you. I told you, they know, I'd ask mm-hmm. you, here's the first question. And we're throwing yeah. all that out because of what's Flip happening. The script's gone because of what's happening right now in D.C. And so instead of doing what we normally do, this is my first question for you. You ready? Oh, What the hell? (laughs) What the hell? (laughs) You know what, Kim? It's actually not. I know it feels like hell. I mean, it is, you know, it is, a you know, the product of fear, which Mm. is, you know, a... um, you know, a a product of hell. But I mean, I have, let's see, when I first started to sense this movement for, for clarity coming about, it was like, I think earlier in 2016, um, like really early in 2016, um, maybe maybe 2015, but really in 2016, I could feel it. Like I could feel Mm -hmm. something coming, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I wanted to be like this, um, you know, this little, alarm um maybe like a blow a show for like stuff is happening stuff is about to happen I mean and then you think about the songs you know we were even singing in church what is it um like that ocean's deep song Mm -hmm. take me deeper than my feet Mm -hmm. could ever wander my faith could be made stronger so we were calling for depth right Mm -hmm. we were we were crying out for like you know, it's time to go deeper. It's time to really walk in faith. Um, we were we were singing songs that were asking for um, revelation. Yeah. And so all of this is really like this curtain being pulled back or this veil being pulled back, this, this proverbial veil, this social veil. Mm. So we can really see what has been manifesting, ruminating mm. and festering, mm-hmm. you know, in like in like the heart, in our hearts, you know, individually, but collectively, you know, Mm. as a society that sits and festers in the wound of, you know, a, a nation, um, unfortunately, uh, the, the wound of a, of a nation, unfortunately, like that sits, that has racialized, has, you know, put a, a racial hierarchy in place Mm -hmm. and devalued, 
uh, and and the very you know people God's God's people like God's image bearers yeah. and you know kind of prioritized some and then devalued others and so we never um, corrected it or reconciled it mm. um, and so yeah it, it's so here we here we sit and even um, you know my response to what I saw in the Capitol was okay I guess we needed more clarity because I think people so many people have recently begun this learning journey of seeing, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing and understanding and really understanding that um, like we need to heal, Um, you know, but then, you know, there are people who resist the pull of love towards healing. Right. That's right. And so then I, you know, when I saw it, I thought, man, that is absolutely bonkers, but it must be what we need Mm -hmm. in order um, to, for, for people to see. And then, so, you know, my response, um, which I rarely like, res- like quote unquote respond to things um, on social media. Um, I'm more of a creative, like create things mm-hmm. to respond to things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did, I said, you know, I, I know people were thinking like, well, this is unusual, but it's not. And so I put a couple of resources there mm-hmm. to show that, um, Yep, it's part of our our history. And even though you could, you know, someone just watching what happened on Tuesday might think, well, what does that have to do with um, race? But again, if you everything if you know our full history, yes, if you know the full history, not just the little tidbits that you get in school, but if you know the full history, yeah, like all this has all happened um, before, and it has it has a lot to do with race mm-hmm. and a mm-hmm. lot to do with the um, the advancement of white supremacy. Yes. And so, you you know, like you're my person, right? Like when I get stuck Mm -hmm. writing a sermon or doing something, like I always call you and you have the gift of prophecy. You can give me clarity. (laughs) And so when this was happening, I I checked you out online, knowing Mm -hmm. we'd be talking. And Mm -hmm. one thing you posted from the great Jimi Hendrix. Oh, yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right. When the power of love Mm -hmm. overcomes the love of power, Mm -hmm. the world will know peace. Mm -hmm. I mean. Jimi Hendrix, see. Go on, Jimi. (laughs) Go on, Jimi. Go on out. Actually, people should study his life more. That'll teach you a lot about his great American. Yeah, I mean, even even that's like a nugget for people, right, of just an understanding. And and I get there's, you know, I've talked many times. There's certain there's a percentage of people who are going to believe exactly what they're believing, and they have contempt prior to investigation. They're never going to look at systemic racism. They're never going to watch, you know, Just Mercy. They're never going to read certain books, mm-hmm. kind of thing. And mm-hmm. that's that's not your audience, right? And I mean, you know, the best that I can do is to be here for the people who want to learn. Yeah. That has been my pleasure. Oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. Like when Spirit was telling me you know, do this publicly because of course, like this has been a part of my life. A lot of people don't know that it's been a part of my life for a long, long time. I've had so much practice in this area. And then even um, I'm a part, I'm in a multi-ethnic family. So my husband is white. So we have these multi-ethnic children. And so we have lived things out and put things in place that, you know, a lot of people find would find fearful to even bring up in conversation, but I'm like, you know, we can't send our kids out Right. Into the world, um, thinking, telling them like, oh, it's a post-racial society and, you know, race doesn't matter. I wish it didn't. And one day it won't, but we're not there yet. Right. Um, so I remember being kind of pushed and prompt, prompted to do this publicly. And I remember thinking like, no, nobody's going to need this. Like nobody's mm-hmm. going to want to talk mm-hmm. about this. And, you know, that's why I don't know why we don't believe Holy Spirit when, you know, right, when, right, right. Yeah, yeah, right. right. And so it has just been a joy and a pleasure to, to see how many people um, have started a learning journey. And, and yes, I have to be, we have to be very careful um, with our energy, with our gifts that, you know, we, we do reserve it for the people who are wanting to, because then you don't, you know, I don't want to battle with people. It's like, mm. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to manipulate you to believe the way I believe. I mean, Mm -hmm. honestly, I feel like people are so being manipulated. Like I'm trying to help you 
um, it's trying to equip you so you won't be manipulated is right. my mindset. Yeah. So what, and then what happens, and I've seen this happen a lot, is then the people who are far, far from the shared understanding of race and racism and white supremacy and our country. So people who are far, far from that understanding, well, they are to some degree close to people who have started on a learning journey. Mm. So then I've seen people who have started a learning journey and maybe they are on step one or step two, you know, into their learning journey. Well, they reach back and get people who haven't started yet, you know, yeah. and so yeah. forth and so on. It's a ripple yeah. effect. So, you know, I've witnessed people who, um, I mean, they tell me, they say, if I had not, you know, if if it weren't for you or if it weren't for this understanding that I have gained, mm. yeah, they say, I probably would have, you know, been one of these people who believe this or would still be manipulated by right. whatever in this way. Right. Yeah, so. absolutely. That's so beautiful. What's the difference between white supremacy and white privilege? Okay, so... I mean, essentially, white supremacy is an is an ideology, like a belief um, and a practice that um, you, the descendants of Europeans, specific specifically, um, um, what North? Sorry, let me get my direction right. Northwestern, yeah, Europeans, uh, Aryan, you know, are like you know this master race mm-hmm. and. Of course, the, the world didn't get together and decide that. <laughs> like, right. that's not how that happened. Right. We didn't vote on it. <laughs> we didn't vote. That wasn't a vote. You know, but of course, they decided that. Right. That's right. <laughs> and then yeah. um, as, you know, then as that was, you know, developed, um, and because it's a whole, you know, it's a long narrative, but as it was developed in America in order to justify genocide of the indigenous people mm. and and hoarding land for the colonizers and then mm. you know to justify like because how could you then say um you know god you know um you know god created all of us like so you you couldn't count a person um a human while you're murdering and exploiting mm. and stealing from them and, and being and, Enslave, yeah, and enslaving mm-hmm. them. So mm-hmm. we have to then justify mm. um, what we're doing, you know, what, what was being done by then kind of creating this hierarchy based on race. And so race is created with white or the descendants of Northern Europeans from the top. And it actually wasn't until more recent history that other Europeans, like Eastern Europeans and Southern Eastern Europeans, got to be kind of folded in mm. or stirred in, you know, so like Italians, yeah, like Italians, you know, were recently and Polish and all kind of recently mm-hmm. um, became, became into this white racial category. So anyway, white, that's what white supremacy is. It's this belief that, um, yeah, this um, European um, light skinned, people um, are this master race and are superior Mm -hmm. and are, you know, are the top and, 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 you know, should hold all the resources and space and everyone else uh, should be, you know, their laborers or um, yeah, should work for them for the most part. And then, okay. So white privilege and I, and one thing about white privilege that people should understand is, you know, white privilege um, in its origin, was never meant to be this weapon against um, white people. Mm-hmm. That's what it has become. So right. people hear it and get offensive. Mm-hmm. And then when I teach, I actually introduce people to like this, you know, here's Peggy McIntosh, this older white woman is essentially talking about her invisible knapsack of privilege that she walks through the world with that she Mm -hmm. notices as she's learning, you know, she's in graduate school and becoming more conscious, becoming a thinker and and more analytical Then she sees that she gets to like walk through a grocery store or any store without anyone suspecting that she is going to steal, you know, or she can get a band aid and like put like how it went from Peggy McIntosh talking about that to what it is now. I am, well, actually, I'm not surprised anymore. Right, nothing surprises me. It's sad. 
yeah. it, it's sad yeah. because it, it really is not, it really isn't a weapon. It's just, it's a lens of observation. And so white privilege, mm. white privilege simply is, yes, like <clears throat> because you're white skinned or light skinned in, mm-hmm. in this racial hierarchy or this racialized world, then yeah, you have, um, there have been laws, policies, and practices and behaviors to benefit um, white people yes. and to intentionally um, <clears throat> disadvantage people of color, you know, especially African Americans. Right. Um, and so that's essentially um, what white white privilege is. It doesn't mean Kim that um, someone like a it doesn't mean like, I'll just say my husband, for example, it doesn't mean that his parents or, you know, or grandparents who immigrated here didn't work hard. Um, it right. doesn't mean that they didn't do all the things. It doesn't mean that they got anything for free. It just means that they didn't have barriers mm-hmm. based on simply how they look. And of course, over time, because um, people like to kind of dismantle systemic racism and say, well, this, but now this is not a law anymore. And now this has changed and this has been amended mm-hmm. and this has been modified. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's all legislation, but you can't legislate behavior. And so we still, again, are living in that, those laws, <clears throat> especially the financial ones and the psychological ones compounded right. over time. That's right. That's right. So, that's, those are two key words, financial, mm-hmm. right? Because when it comes to redlining, when it comes to bank loans, when it comes to opportunity, mm-hmm. like the, that, that is absolutely proven. I don't know why we're still arguing that with each other. It's absolutely proven like your name on your resume dictates if you get an interview. Mm-hmm. And people don't even know why generally our brown and black sisters and brothers have different names, like right. I, I've had learned that recently. That was wonderful to learn about right. with the history of that. That was great. I and want you to tell me about that. You want me to tell you right now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I saw this. Up, you know, people are like, oh, well, why? <laughs> well, do you want to explain that? You're explaining better well, you than I will. explain it. No, well, I saw an amazing work. video about like when people mm-hmm. were being enslaved and were getting off the boat, so to speak, like they were lined mm-hmm. up and they were their children were given different names. Right. They were given... Yeah. They were told your child is now this name. This is now your name. And Mm -hmm. so it became a way whenever that type of slavery ended. It doesn't mean Mm -hmm. that people were free. Mm -hmm. When that type of traditional slavery ended, they became starting to embrace African names because Mm -hmm. it was taken from them. Right. And create names because that now you have this power, like nobody's naming you. Right. So not only can you like you can embrace an African name or you can just create a name. So that's why a lot of um, African-American names, there's a tradition of even making, quote unquote, everybody's name is made up fundamentally, but True. creating a name like, oh, combining a mom and a dad's name or, right. you know, like I had a student whose name had no vowels. <laughs> Right. I loved it. Right, right. And so he rolled his eyes and I said, you know, I'm like, that is so unique and beautiful. And yeah. I'm sure that that speaks to um, your parents' story of, mm-hmm. of you. But right. yes, go ahead. Yeah. And so that's part of it. And so it even goes into, you know, like if I walk into a grocery store, there is a section that says ethnic care care. <laughs> now, you've taught me this because so if people don't know, I am not completely white. And I wish I didn't look completely white. That's just me. But I do. And I pass. So I have white privilege. But I have very special hair. And I want to talk about it. Be quiet, y'all. I don't want to talk about it. You make fun <laughs> of me all the time, Lucretia. But no, you, I don't. You don't make fun of me. We, we discuss it. We can yeah, safely we discuss it. it. And then I've said I have ethnic hair. And you're the one that said everybody has ethnic hair. <laughs> everybody, Kim. I'm like, that's so logical. Why did I not get that? But when I walk <laughs> into a grocery store and it says ethnic hair for black people, Mm-hmm. then automatically there's a separation. Right. Yeah. There's a, yeah. There's like this um, being invisible, but also hypervisible. So invisible because yes. you don't fit yes. in the norm. Right. And then hypervisible because your hair is ethnic right. and it's different. And That's everybody right. has, everybody has ethnicity. Yes. Hair is just either, you right. know, straight, curly, wavy, coily. From hell. No, never. It's Whatever. all beautiful. The Whatever. hair is beautiful. Okay. See, that's See, all right. Now I need we're therapy. Gonna, Y'all know I need therapy. Started on that. <laughs> no, we're going elsewhere. This okay. is a serious day. We're going to go elsewhere on this. But I hear you. 
Um, but it really is like so the, the hyper visibility about hair, but you can't find a band aid that you can wear that's not visible, right? Yeah. Because it's made for mm-hmm. white people. <laughs> yeah, all the things, all, all the, the things, things made, all the things people. that that white, and that's part of white privilege. It just means you don't have to think yeah. about this. Yeah, you don't have to think about it. Yeah, right. Absolutely, absolutely. And so financially, it's different. Psychologically, it's different because yeah. if you go somewhere and you're treated differently than Mm -hmm. someone else and compare it to those of you who grew up with a sibling, the sibling was favored and that didn't feel great to you. So imagine going anywhere and everywhere constantly Mm -hmm. and being treated differently because of your skin color. Right. Yeah. Like that's so detrimental to you emotionally. Right. You know, exactly. Or like for me, some stuff was just so normal. Like Mm in my, in my little girl mind, Growing up, and I and I do want to make this point, y'all. Like, I'm not that old, right? No, you look good, girl. <laughs> Thank you. But think mm-hmm. about it. Like, I am the first generation of fully integrated people. Like, wow. in terms of, I integrated my preschool. And then, so I have mm-hmm. been going to school with, you know, white people for my whole life, um, f- except for the four years when I attended South Carolina State University because it's an HBCU. Right. Um. Um, but so think about, so my parents, of course, grew up during Jim Crow because we think this stuff was so far away. Right. 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 But no, my parents grew up during Jim Crow and then, um, caught integration a little bit at the end. Like my dad, um, kind of integrated a high school. Okay. Where was, I was going somewhere with that though. You're saying you're the first one. Well, no, I was saying, so then me being in a society where white people are othering me all the time mm. it was just so normal. It's so normal because you were saying like the how it wears on you psychologically. Mm-hmm. So I, I, for me, I think it just becomes a part of this is what white people do. Like this is white mm. behavior for me. Right. And um, and so yeah, I have to actually sit and think about the the psychological trauma. Mm-hmm. Because I think it, um, because I'm so accustomed to it, I've developed what the callus and a coping mechanism right. and, um, and even just interpreting. And so even for me, you know, when we talk about racial healing, that's so broad mm-hmm. because that's, you know, that's intrapersonal, that's interpersonal, mm-hmm. that's social, that's systemic, all of these, you know, healing on in all of these areas. Um, but like for me personally, yeah, I had this, like, I didn't know, like, there was trauma and psychological stuff that I, I didn't even know until I began this healing journey, um, where I had just kind of buried things and just put a, you know, put a gate or a wall up and you just keep on going because it's so yeah. normal. And then right. God has a sense of and I married this white guy. And so then even more, because now <laughs> it's like... Even in my home, you know, white people in my home. <laughs> no, but even he could see some things and point things out that I couldn't. Mm, right. So back to the name thing, my name is not African. It's not African-American. My name is very European of, right. of right. the Latin language. <laughs> yeah. 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 But <laughs> on my brown skin, mm-hmm. people think that it's a, um, a created name. So white people will refuse to learn it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. it's a white name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they refuse to learn so it. Funny. <laughs> like it's oh, it's so hard. It starts with a love. It ends with a shove. It's hard. <laughs> well, I didn't realize. So I didn't realize that, like, say when I meet a person, a white person, and they would say, Do you have a nickname? Oh. I'm like, sure. And I tell them, I didn't know that what they were doing until my husband, well, Nathan before we got married, he was like, no, you will say her whole name. You will not ever shorten her name. And then yeah. he told me that that's what they were doing. They were refusing wow. to learn my name. Right. And that's dishonoring, of course. And that's I right. had no idea. So it's hilarious because, yeah, there's a whole, that's this whole thing. Like, um, nobody calls me, nobody shortens my name yeah. since I've been married. So that's how, like, if somebody calls me a nickname, I'm like, oh, like this person knew me before I got married. And right. everybody <laughs> I got married right, says, right. 
It's respect. It's a whole name. Yeah. Well, it is. And then, yeah, you should, like, of course you can learn. You can say Lucretia. Stop right. it. I can say Lucretia. So anybody can say it. So we can do this. And plus, well, it's, va- it's, it's valuing a person, period. You learn their name. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Period. But I was, you know, that was my example of how I just had, you were talking about psychological. Yes like trauma and damage and I'm, and I'm like yeah and also you there's these calluses where I'm accustomed to sure. stuff and so I don't even question it like walking into a store it's second nature that people are going to look at me and think that I may steal something mm. so without even thinking about it I make sure that people see my hands uh, my husband bought me this big beautiful Tory Burch bag and I'm like uh-oh Cause when I walk in a store with a big purse, you know, mm-hmm. people are, th- exactly. and I've seen, I've seen the, um, the retail people. Um, yeah. Like they will look at each other and give each other a little sign, like watch her purse, you yeah. know, watch her purse. Oh yeah. And I just chuckle. Cause I'm like, now you're going to watch me and what, and then nothing's going to happen. It's going right. to be like boring or whatever. But, right. and then I have to catch myself, like, look at you, um, you know, changing or you know, adjusting your behavior so that white people feel safe and Mm. and, and, and inadvertently don't hurt you. Right. Because it's really you that's not safe. But you're trying to make sure they're safe. And so the psychological impact. Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure they feel safe. Right. That they, I'm trying to make sure they don't feel threatened by me. But again, it's so, I don't even think about it. I just do it. Mm -hmm. And then I have to catch myself. Right. It's ingrained. It's just so imprinted on you. It's ingrained. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it, and, it, and people will say, and sometimes people will say, well, your parents should not have taught you that. My parents didn't teach me that. White people yeah. taught me that. That's right. That's right. hundred <laughs> percent. That's important to know. So what's the psychological impact, yeah. you think, of you watching the news, what's happening on the Capitol, mm-hmm. white people watching it? Because, again, you've been conditioned to adapt, you've been conditioned mm-hmm. to certain things, and then to watch this, like, do you think it's more shocking for white people? Do you think it's right because it's not? I don't. I don't get the impression it's shocking for you. Okay, well, I was, yeah, it wasn't shocking. Like I've seen this behavior. The part about it, them breaching the Capitol. Now that was over the top. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That that was yeah. The capital part was over the top, but that kind of uh you know, mob mm-hmm. mentality and mm-hmm. rage, that white rage, mm-hmm. um, is the name of Carol Anderson's book. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, and I like let's see, I posted Wilmington's lie. Um, same thing happened and in Wilmington with mm-hmm. uh elected officials, and then of course um, you know, Republican Senator of South Carolina, Lindsey Graham also, mm-hmm. which I, this was a surprise to me. He alluded to, or he told the history that that's the same kind of thing that led to, um, that was a part of reconstruction that led to the new Jim Crow. So another great resource for that was Stony the Road. Um, again, this has happened before. And when you know full American history, coups, mobs, murderous mobs, Mm -hmm. invoking and acting violence on Mm -hmm. um, minoritized groups Mm -hmm. um, is nothing new. It's like, it has happened. So to see that wasn't surprising, you know, but there was Mm -hmm. the element of, oh, y'all took it to a whole new level in yeah. Breach the Capitol. And so to see what was jarring, really what was jarring and heartbreaking for me was to know that even during the Civil War, the Confederate battle flag did not, you know, make it into the Capitol. Mm-hmm. And then on Tuesday or whatever day that was, um, there that guy was oh. with the Confederate battle flag. Wow. Big flag walking through the Capitol building. That was painful. Mm-hmm. It was painful. I wasn't, mm. it wasn't scary. It was painful. And then, Thank you know, again, we don't hide these things from our children. So to see my nine-year-old 
you know, see a little what was happening. She goes, oh, and when she when she says, oh, that's scary, like her whole body like shakes. Mm-hmm. And that breaks my heart. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, that is so yeah. heartbreaking. So, you know, there's a lot of comparison right now and it's and it's mm-hmm. a necessary comparison, the stark contrast <laughs> of of people mm-hmm. representing trying to get some equality for black people, trying to show up so that black people stop getting <laughs> killed. And mm-hmm. then what happened was happening right. this week. And how how are there so many police? How are there so many guns drawn on children? How are there so much happening? Do you have words for that? Can you help us understand? How, like, I don't know how someone could not see the differences. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure there's some right. that can. So but people I, will do... Well, because people will do mental gymnastics to stay stuck. Mm. You know, it's just kind of like that story you've heard. And I'm not going to tell that whole story, the whole analogy of where, you know, there's the flood and God sends all of these, you know, people by the boat and the helicopter to rescue. Mm -hmm. And then the person finally drowns and says, oh, God, you didn't (laughs) didn't help me. Um, You know, and again, um, so people will work really hard to you know, stay on that roof and not be rescued. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but I think, um, so my 13 year old, I'm like, I asked her, so what did, what did, what did you all talk about during school? And she said, um, oh, no, fortunately she had a dental appointment. So she missed kind of a lot of her classes, um, which I was like, yay. Cause I knew mm-hmm. <laughs> that was going to be um, very ill-informed, misinformed, and disinformed, mm. you know, conversation going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but she said, you know, she goes, but on TikTok, you know, the whole thing on TikTok was about that. Was it about the stark contrast between how much the police are militarized against mm. peaceful protesting um, on one hand, and then seem to be, to a degree, aiding the kind of the mob at the Capitol on the mm-hmm. other hand. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I mean, we know, we know the difference, like, you know, with, and, and I also think this is interesting that everything kind of gets, you know, any, any advocacy for decency, you know, gets, lumped up under Black Lives Matter, like the movement or the, the organization, and then gets weaponized, right. unfortunately. Right. Um, but um, because, you know, our narrative in the United States cur- currently, and again, if you've, you know, you've been given a little, little bitty tidbits of history um, in school and you really haven't studied our history, well, the narrative is one that, you know, we're, we're this nation that was kind of given to us by God for white people. And so, you know, even the rise of the Ku Klux Klan came out of this defending, you know, mm-hmm. whiteness and the defending the, the hierarchy. And so then on one hand, you know, people get the group that stormed the Capitol, they get, they have deemed themselves the patriots and the preservers wow. of, you know, the white American way so, and the you know they have aligned themselves with anything that opposes um, the movement for belonging and justice. Mm. So, and then the movement for belonging and justice um, gets labeled, you know, somehow um, like resistance or mm-hmm. you know anti patriotic or anti. Um, and it's also interesting because, you know, if you sit down and look at, like, if you take the, um, like, the even the various symbols and emblems that were being flown on Tuesday by the people who stormed the Capitol, there's so many, so many conflicting ideologies mm. there. Like, how can you be, how can you be anti-government, but pro police right see yeah yeah (laughs) well how can you have an american flag and a confederate battle flag side by side right those don't get together and so people of course are being fueled by i want to say 
I would say people are being fueled by fear, a lack of under and a lack of understanding, you know, and a lack um, of of care. Um, and then given this false sense of desperation, mm-hmm. because you know, because you know, as we saw. You like there is no need to like the law is on your side. Like if you know your history, <laughs> you know, right. like right. policies and laws are on your side. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the privilege, you have the advantage as a white group, as a white organization. You don't it, have to work as hard as mm-hmm. like Black Lives Matter or people of color or African Americans to be seen and valued and to belong. And so it's always these competing mm-hmm. identities and narratives. Can you give people one example of a policy, some understanding when you're t- we're talking about the law about how mm-hmm. that th- what you're saying applies to that th- it is advantageous for white people? Oh well, let's see. Let me think of a policy. I would, well, what? Okay, so what I mean by that is, you know historically, you know, we've seen the law work in favor of, of white people. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, if you, you can, you can go to take something to the courts and have, you know, we, we, there are judges, white judges there. Are, I mean, there's a whole mm-hmm. system set in place to, um, to meet your needs. So, right. And that's why, and because there is a whole system set in place to meet your needs, it, then what the person who's trying to manipulate you has to do is to then make you think that, um, yeah, that system um, has been breached. So that's why it's important. There, it's important to this whole thing that there's this belief of election fraud mm. when historically in our country. The only there, I'll just say there has been very tiny, like a very little bit of election fraud. And it's usually um, not hmm, what I'm trying to say. Usually the fraud is from the majority group, not because they're trying because like ethnic majorities are Mm -hmm. trying to maintain power. Right. It's right. not the fraud isn't coming from like I'll just say plainly, we've had in our country a problem of voter suppression that is that widespread documented from post emancipation all the way to now, like mm-hmm. documented voter suppression. That's what we should be concerned about. That's right. That's but right. for somebody to tell like this group of white people for someone to tell this group, and I know it was more than just white people in the group, but I'm saying for someone to tell this group of white people that um, the things that are, you know, that are, have been laid in place for you, like for you to make, to stir them into this desperation, they have to be lied to. Mm-hmm. Like there, there needs to be this lie that says, you know, you're, um, you've been violated. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah, I believe that we all have been violated, however, um, but not through like a fraudulent election. And so that's what I think that's the part that has really thrown me is Mm -hmm. how, I don't know, I guess it's like, like, where is the, where is the evidence? So, mm-hmm. for example, when I teach on the history of race in our country, I say, okay, all of this is written down. We can start with the con- we'll, we can start with the Constitution. We can we can actually look at actual policies mm-hmm. and um, and practices. Like all of this is documented. None of this is made up. Right. But people will think that systemic racism is made up. Like no, everything is documented. Yeah. That's how they put the word systemic on there. Right. But then. So then, you know, and then people will think that, so then that's why it baffles me that 
okay, we're, we need to see, like, I'm open to seeing if right. the election was rigged. You know, when that, when that was first put out there, I'm like, oh, okay, let's, well, let's not let that happen. You know, right. Sure. sure. <laughs> right. Can you, can you explain what happened in Georgia? What happened in Georgia with the senators being elected? Is that what you mean? Yes, and just the Stacey Act, <clears throat> right? And the excitement with that, and and what happened, and and that's voter suppression and things that happened, and the overturn of that. Like there was yeah. something, yeah. Could you explain that? Yeah, that's pretty cool. So yeah, yeah you have this state in North Carolina. We will. I'm hoping we will follow suit because we've had we're on record, you know, recently for outrages. Voter suppression, it's, a, it's crazy to be written in the history books. Mm. You know, whenever they want to give a recent example of voter suppression, they go, and North Carolina, you know, excuse me, I need to drink water. Hmm. But essentially, Kim, what's happening um, is that, yes, we have, like, demographics are changing. And so, um, you know, you have states like, let's just say North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, these southern states that have had um, like massive population of um, black people in the states. And, you know, post emancipation, there was this fear if like, okay, if all these people vote, then the people in power will lose power and lose their seats. And that's essentially what happened, which is which was reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So during the time of reconstruction, we had more black senators and congressmen than all at one time than we've Mm -hmm. had since then. And then of course what happened was like these coups and these, you know, these uprisings um, um, from Klan members and other, you know, white organizations. But anyway, so we we have been living in kind of the tradition of that where, um, you know, the, 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 there have been a lot of um, practices that are legal and acceptable, but the outcome is um, the black vote gets suppressed, mm-hmm. you know, so whether that is doing away with, you know, voting sites or trying to implement um, IDs, um, you know, and, you know, so here's an example of like how, you know, voter ID um, um, and messing with the Voter Act um, of 1964, like it, this whole notion of, well, um, college IDs and and um, kind of IDs that are, or let's see, normal for a Black person to have, well, those IDs won't count for voter mm-hmm. registration, but like um, your gun license counts as, <laughs> as a, um, huh. an ID for your voter registration. So all, anyway, all of the gymnastics uh, that are legalized um, in order to keep black people from the polls, well then, you know, Stacey Abrams um, did a lot of work organizing um, to, you know, essentially overturn Mm. all of that. So you have people understanding that um, we do have power. And I mean, all of us, not not all black people. Yeah, yeah, we can, we have a a collective power. And so it takes, you know, awakening people to being active in, you know, our our government. You know, I think... um, traditionally or typically in our history, we have thought of our government more like um, like a ruling a ruling class. Like we mm-hmm. abdicate our power to this ruling authority. We mm-hmm. sometimes we do this in churches too with pastors, like the pastor will tell me how to think and how to believe. Right. You know, there's exactly. that right. Yes. <laughs> you know? yes, yes, yes. And, and so and so kind of we do that. And I think that so it has taken like Stacey Abrams in Georgia has really um, and inspired, awakened, you know, of course, it's organized mm. so that you understand that, um, no, like each person has this, uh, can take on a responsibility and make an impact. And so um, then you have this changing demographic of Georgia where um, 
you know, people are moving from all over the world, like to live, let's just say in Atlanta. So you don't have like the, the, the typical or the traditional, like, um, old school Southern Dixiecrat mindset that is right. the majority right. there, right? Yeah. You have right. Um, you have populations that are growing that are not from that particular um, Southern, like I said, Dix- Dixiecrat type of mm-hmm. uh, mindset. So it's multiple things happening. And so it's about harnessing that power. And yeah, they kind of voted out the old, I'll just say that, and ushered right. in the new. Some other yeah. cool things happened also in Georgia where um, in rural places, because again, you know, now politicians like to, um, well, not the politicians, but you know, people who are, uh, their strategists, you know, are like, well, now let's say it's the rural against the urban. Well, um, that's become a little tricky because lots of people are moving out of urban spaces. So people who, mm-hmm you know, think urban or live in rural spaces. Um, I know we currently, we live in a rural space, but where we live is like a, you know, it's considered like a quote unquote suburb of a city, of an urban space. And so someone was just assuming that we, assuming our political views just because we lived in a rural Uh, space. I got you. uh, Sorry, assuming that of my husband, not of me. (laughs) Of course, they make a different assumption about me. Don't assume Right. Because we are none of that. We're neither. Uh, we're independent. But um, and so, you know, my husband was like, uh, no, but that is not my political affiliation. Right. And the right. guy said, oh, well, because around here, everybody is, you know, of a particular political affiliation. And he's like, not anymore. That's right. <laughs> well, maybe that was that, that way. That yeah. So same in, in Georgia. And so uh, I saw that. And I'm not an expert on Georgia. So if you're in Georgia listening, please excuse uh, me because right, I'm like right. generalizing like crazy. Yeah. But I think it was at least four or more um, black sheriffs that were elected because oh, um, they I know. And so that's rural yeah. spaces yeah. and electing black sheriffs because, yeah, they did not. They well, first of all, you, the sheriffs themselves like had to decide to run. And that's right. the thing, too, like we have to be more active. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm all like, how do I get on the school board? You know, like, how do I, sure. we have to be more active and be Mm -hmm. in, be gate, become gatekeepers and the decision makers and not just criticize the gatekeepers. Right. And the decision makers, like, how about if we put ourselves out there and give people some more choices and. Right. Right. Okay. So yeah, it's a new reality. No, I think it's great. So speaking of your husband, let's talk about Nathan (laughs) for a second. Um, because when oh, he's, let's talk about Nathan. yeah, he's a great guy. And so when he's spoken publicly for ICU talks mm-hmm. and different stuff, uh, one thing he does consistently is start off by saying, Hey, I'm Nathan and I'm married to a black woman, you know, and I'm racist. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. your, your, how you bring through all your classes that you do, your understanding of racism to people, what it means to be racist. Cause so many people this year have been so defensive mm-hmm. about saying I'm not racist. And I'm right. like, you don't know the, then right. you don't know the definition. Definition. Yeah. Right. So can you elaborate on what it means to be racist? To be- sure. <laughs> I mean, because essentially we've all been racialized because we live in a racialized country. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes people move here from another country or they go live someplace else for a long time, come back and they go, oh, my Lord. Like the United States is so all about race, race, Mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And everything is race based and people want to deny that. But yeah, our foundation, our foundation, much much of our foundation is very race based. And so you cannot grow up here and drink the water and breathe the air, watch the TV, you know, (laughs) read the books, get the American education and not have been impacted. And so when he's saying I'm racist, that means, yes, he has been, he what has been baked in him is mm-hmm. the notion of this racial hierarchy right. and that white people are better. And yeah. so he has to, I mean, he loves me. Um, like he really loves me, you right. know, and, um, and he loves our girls who are brown. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he has to be intentional right. to counteract that racialized conditioning. Mm-hmm. Um, that would like if he isn't being intentional, then that means he's just going in the flow of yeah, our racial, our racial yeah. status quo. Right. 
Right. So that's so good for people to hear that. Listen, if you anything, anything you get conditioned to believe a child, if you don't challenge it as an adult, you just go mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. And you don't know if it's your mm-hmm. truth or truth passed down to you. That's good. Yeah, and I, good. I just I love that y'all question that. Before we wrap up, will you talk about Bronicity? Will you talk about the name oh, sure. of it, what it means, and tell people oh, about sure. the amazing classes that y'all y'all provide people online? Sure. Well, our organiz- organization, Brownicity, um, we essentially exist to um, bring the shared understanding so that we can truly cultivate um, communities of belonging and and justice. And you know, justice is is love. Because sometimes people mm. think justice is like revenge, mm. and they confuse that. Yeah, like no, good. like just like God is just justice, like that. You yeah, know, that's good. I like <laughs> so, that. I like that. Um. But um, what I and the people, the team of Brown City, like what we have understood, so we have this common understanding, is that, you know, fundamentally our schools and, you know, or our places of education, our institutions of education, so that could be churches, that could be schools, have done us a disservice in kind of the core and given us our core understanding of what has occurred in our country, right? So we have all kinds of gaps and understanding. Um, some people don't even know that it's okay to ask questions and think. Right. You know, right. some people have been conditioned like this is the information you're supposed to know, hold tight to it, and it gives you your identity, right? Mm-hmm. So it has messed people up, right? Yeah. So what we have <laughs> what we do with Brownicity is we offer um like a- education to to give you a foundation or to eat to give you a better foundation upon which to build. So our courses like I have a heart for beginners um, because they're so people want to learn. Mm. And a lot of anti-racism education material is for people who are already um, on the journey or already right. a little advanced. Right. And so, you know, I've created um, a few courses for to onboard beginners. Like, mm. you know, this is what this means, you know, and right. this is what, you know, this means yeah. so that yeah. you can be built because I like to use the metaphor of like, if someone isn't fed, like we can't take tell people who haven't been fed and nurtured and say, okay, now run this marathon mm-hmm. because it's a marathon. And then people, you know, try to stand up. They can't even stand up, you know, right. or, or right. they go, oh, it's too hard. I'm out. Or yeah. people maybe stand up and take a step and they go, I'm good. I can't do anymore. Or this is so hard. Well, of course it is because you haven't been built up. Your mus- mm-hmm. muscles are atrophied. You haven't been nourished. So, um, so that's what we do. We try to, fill and gaps and help build people mm. and fill your de- deficit. And so what brownicity is a funny word and it's a made up word um, because I'm creative and creativity will get us to our future. You all. Amen. So we have to be creative, Amen. but um, brownicity is a combination of the word Brown and ethnicity and Brown represents the melanin mm-hmm. that we all have. And I have a lot of active melanin, which is why I'm, you know, this color and Kim has, um, oh less active gosh. melanin, it makes which is me why so she, mad. She's which so is mad. Why that color, but it all, you know, it's all a story about mm-hmm. um, our ancestry, but um, and our connection to the environment, right? Um, mm-hmm. Our environment, our ancestors, the sun, all have to do with our mm-hmm. brownness. Right. We are all hues of brown, and then ethnicity is uh, short for or represents the word ethnicity, and ethnicity means that which we have in common. Mm-hmm. So we are many hues and one humanity. Wow, that's so beautiful. And so there's no way, okay, rephrase that. <laughs> In this era, I have to rephrase that. There's a minimum, as a modicum chance that somebody would go through your class and remain the exact same as they started. <laughs> because you're going to be changed. The way it's done, the level of information, how it's presented, every angle is considered. It is beautiful, amazing information, and it it will rock you if you have never studied how synthetic racism <laughs> started, developed, and got to where it is. It will it it's just unnerving, and it needs to happen. So, um, highly, highly recommend that. And your TED Talk from 2017 <laughs> when we did that. Your TED Talk is on YouTube. Yeah. 
which is part of educating children and helping people understand and speaking yep. openly about this. But really, really, people reading your book, doing the workbook, and doing your class. Right. Highly recommend. It'll, it's very helpful. It's very helpful. Yes. Yes. And actually, I, I, I think I can count on like a couple of fingers, people who have like gone through it. But you got it. But I think you do have to work really hard to unsee what you mm -hmm. what you've seen. Yes, it's painful to see, to think you're a part of it. And I didn't mean to be a part of it. I can still be a part of it. Oh, right. Yeah. And so there's no blame. Older. There's right. no blame or shame. Well, yeah, it's, it's just like we won't get better you, if we blame and shame. Right. Right. Yeah. You just learn. And then what happens is you learn and you go, OK, well, I want to take the responsibility for creating a better. Yeah. Whatever. Society, right. world, school, whatever right. your sphere. Right, mm -hmm. right. And if y'all do the class, there's a small portion of it about polyvagal theory okay. that I get to do that I explain to everybody about mm -hmm. so many things that you see in videos with, mm -hmm. with brown people interacting with police officers, et cetera, and what's happening for both. That's like, right. You're, you're, the, you're the daughter of a police officer. I'm the daughter right. of, of an attorney. Right. We both respect law enforcement tremendously. That's right. And so it's about looking at all sides of it and what's happening to people based on trauma and why people respond differently than you do. And we it's you'll even include that to under, so people get a better understanding. Yeah. We're gonna have to have you back again. Because and we have a learning community where you can take several classes and I recommend that you take like as many of the classes in there as you can. It's like, come and join the learning community. It's only yeah. $10 a month and you can take all these courses um, yeah. or, you know, or you can, um, you know, purchase course, a course, the courses that she's talking about right. solo. But yeah, you should check. And Kim, Kim has a course in there. Yeah, I get that. Holly Bagel, she does. She's, yeah, yes. it's amazing. No, I would love to come back because I want people to have understanding. Yeah, I saw your chart. So I'm like, oh my, I love my chart. I, mean, I, I, I know, I want you to come chart. Chart. <laughs> I will bring the chart. Do y'all have a polyvagal flip chart I got for Christmas? It's done by yes. Deb Dana. You can get it on Amazon. That's amazing. It excites me. And I, listen, my teachers in high school would never believe being the horrible <laughs> drunk kid I was that all these years later I get excited over a polyvagal flip chart, but I do. I love it. It's great. I love it. It's Learning great. is fun. It is. And I love you. I always learn. When we talk, I'm going to have to have you, you back because we were going to be very personal today about your life. Yeah. And I, I didn't, need you to therapize me. I was going to therapize you. I need to come yeah. to your house. I need to, yes, live, in you your, do. I need yeah, to live in your neighborhood. Actually. Yeah. I'm going to have a book. I have a book here for you. Um, see if I, I wish I could pass it oh, yeah. through this. Oh, yeah. I'm that. coming to your house to get that book. So, yes. all right. Thank you, Lucretia. Dr. Lucretia Carter Berry, amazing woman. Please check out Barnicity. Check out her TED Talk and find her on social media and any other way you can be a part of her life. Your life will not be the same once Lucretia enters into it. So thank you, Lucretia. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. You're very welcome. All right, everybody. Your lid got flipped, and I hope you were able to reconnect to who God yes. says that you actually are. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Lid with Kim Honeycutt. Please subscribe, rate, and share. You can find Kim on Facebook or Instagram at KB Honeycut. To get an autographed copy of Kim's book, visit butyourmotherlovesyou.com. Remember, no matter what, treat yourself well today. <laughs>